everyone. Um, we're trying this again from my account. I'm supposed to have pro project, I, I'm actually supposed to be going on Project Proactive's account and for some reason I can't get on her account. Okay, I see you. Um, hopefully, up uh, and here, so there's the, res there's the prompt. Okay. We'll have you on in a second. Here it comes, I think, it's coming. <laughs> it's okay. so weird for me to be on the bottom. <laughs> This is so strange. <laughs> I'm not sure why that happens, but I think we're we're learning new things as tech, technology changes all the time. So it's all good. <laughs> I mean, this is good practice for being, you know, adaptive and <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, Exa adaptive on the fly. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, okay, this is fun. I'm I'm so not used to this. I feel like I'm a little thrown. If you off. want, we can we can turn the screen <laughs> upside down. <laughs> Exactly. That's fine. <laughs> um, um, okay. So um, I'm, I uh, can, I, don't, <laughs> I have to like reorient. Like We're all resetting. We're going to take a moment. We're okay. Do some meditation. <laughs> we're all here. It's all good. We're thanking. We're thanking. I feel like you're interviewing me because <laughs> you're on top. Just pretend I'm on, I'm on the bottom and it's all okay. good. <laughs> okay. Anyways, so let's get right into, um, what do you, can you tell us first a little bit about yourself and then why you started, I was supposed to have a baby. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for bringing me on here, allowing me to come on and talk about my handle. Um, I feel uh, I feel very fortunate to be amongst the group of individuals that you've had the pleasure of introducing to your audience. So I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity. Um, I, so my name is Amy Barron. I am a pediatrician by training and I um, came to this work. So my handle is, I was supposed to have a baby. And I came to this work really from a place of personal pain and suffering. Um, I, as I said, I'm trained as a pediatrician and through the course of my own personal fertility journey, I had uh, secondary infertility and I also had six miscarriages, um, four of which were in the second trimester. Um, and I, you know, at that time, I, I, I'm old, but I'm not so old. Um, but I, so what we're talking about is my last miscarriage was about, um, was about seven years ago. And at that time we, you know, Instagram was in full force, the community at large, the public at large, we're, we're just starting to talk about mental health issues as a whole. Um, and also, and again, like this is the topic of tonight, how infertility and pregnancy loss and stillbirth are not mental health issues, but in it, but, but people sort of couch them that way. And so I would say that people as a whole and society as a whole was also just starting to um, recognize that infertility and pregnancy loss were something that people were struggling with and starting to have TV shows, um, newspaper articles, celebrities were starting to come out and talk about their stories as well. So it was really just coming to the fore. Um, my journey really happened somewhere between seven and 12 years ago. And at that time, nobody was talking about it. And I felt very alone as so many people do. And I, I just kept saying to myself, there has to be another way. There has to be a support system. There has to be this network. Why, why don't these things exist? Um, and the truth is, is that there are, were at that time and continue to be many Jewish organizations that are devoted to helping families who are struggling with these exact issues. Uh, organizations both locally, I, I live in New York, both locally and around the globe that are on the ground, that are doing this work on a daily basis that, you know, help women get to different doctors, help families finance the fertility treatments, offering support groups, both in person and on the phone, 
um, helping people with specific, you know, lab tests and so on and so forth. So these supports exist. And, and I should say from the other end, also um, from the loss end, organizations have existed for a long time that provide support after a miscarriage or a stillbirth or an infant loss with pregnancy loss support packages with lots of um, networks, uh, both in person and online support groups. So all of those things do exist yet. Now, again, we're talking about between seven and 12 years ago, I, I felt alone. I, you know, I yeah. would go to doctor's appointments and see dozens and dozens and dozens of people in the waiting room. And yet I felt alone. And so I, what, and, and I, what happened was, so I, I was asked to speak locally in my own Jewish community and my own community about my experiences. And then I was connected with um, Riva Judas, who runs the organization called Nechama Comfort, which is based in Teaneck. Um, and I worked with her and with her team for the last three years, um, helping to support families who are, are struggling with infant and pregnancy loss. Um, and, and really what I found is that those networks exist. Uh, that, that organization is robust and helps dozens and dozens of people on a monthly basis all over the world. But as a physician and as someone who had a personal story, I was still getting filtered also, you know, many, many calls on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis from people who had heard about me, who knew that I had this experience, who knew that I could speak to infertility, I could speak to surrogacy and adoption, not because I per se had gone through a surrogacy and adoption, but because of my experiences and the networks that I had, I had created, I developed these you know, this cachet of individuals who I really could reach out to when someone reached out to me and who I could send them on their way and support them. And I think really what happened was I realized and recognized first in myself and then in the families that I kept coming across and kept speaking with that, you know, yes, it's wonderful to have these support groups. It's wonderful to be able to have an address and a place to go to have that feeling of resonance. But the statistics are that one in four pregnancies end in some kinds of a loss. And also on the flip side for infertility, the statistics are that somewhere between one and six and one in eight couples are struggling with infertility. And so if those numbers are true, just in the New York area alone, there are hundreds, if not thousands of couples and individuals who are struggling. And yet the support groups, both in person, online, on the phone, are paltry in, in terms of the attendance, meaning yes, the in-person attendance of these support groups are quite small, but when once you sort of add in the anonymous nature of some of the groups, be it online or be it in, on the phone, then you start getting the numbers. Then people feel safe. They feel that they're still in control of their story, that their privacy has not been compromised, and they feel they can reach out for support in that way. And really what I realized is that social media was yet an untapped market in this space, that all of those organizations which were doing so, such incredible work and so much, the, the work that they're doing is vital and they need to continue to do their work, but they weren't utilizing social media in the way that it could be utilized to reach out to those families. And so what they were doing is they were, they were plugging their programs, which are incredible, they were using it to raise donations, which are absolutely necessary. But in terms of offering support, in terms of offering chizok, in terms of telling personal stories, it wasn't happening. And I, I kept sort of just going over and over again in my head thinking, I, I can do this and I can create a space knowing that I was already running Nechama Comfort social media, social media handle. 
I knew that I had the ability to create a handle to connect with all of these individuals and families and be able to reach them in their beds at two o'clock in the morning when they're crying after they've just had a miscarriage or after their last cycle has failed or they can't get to see a doctor that they really need to see for the next three months and they're in a holding pattern. You know, there's so many reasons why people are struggling and suffering along this journey and they're not coming out to programs and they're not going to groups, but they're deeply, deeply suffering. And so that's how this handle started. And I'm, I'm incredibly grateful and, and honored to be able to do this, to, to have the skill set to be able to do this. It's really important. I, I, like when, when you said that, it reminded me of, of a story that somebody once, that I was sitting with somebody in shul and they were holding their baby, but they were married for, I think over 10 years and they had their first baby. And it was, I think, right after, maybe it was like during Pesach, and she said, you know, I wouldn't have come if I didn't have a baby because my I know my family all gets together for Pesach, and I, but I wouldn't have come if because, because my sister-in-laws all had baby, had, had like tons of kids, and it was just getting too much for me. And um, so thank God I can finally be here with my family and not feel so different from everybody. Right. I, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot to unpack about that specific, um, that specific vignette, but I, I think, you know, the, the isolation that she felt and that so many people feel as being tagged as other, that they're not in the same space as other people in the community. They're not on the same playing field. They're not talking about, you know, diapers and they're not talking about breastfeeding versus bottle feeding or preschools or elementary schools. They're still not there yet. And so the pain of being isolated, one, in terms of maybe not feeling comfortable sharing their own experiences in addition to feeling isolated from everything else that's going around them is really one of deep pain. That isolation is deep, deep pain. And it is a very, very common feeling among so many people in this community. Um, so when you say infertility is not a mental illness. So that is true. Um, why do you think that there's that? So, I mean, I, I can assume that it comes along with other, with mental health concerns. Correct. But, it can, um, not it always. Can. It can. Correct. So can you just um, like elaborate on what you meant by that? Absolutely. Um, I, this is a topic that I really um, wanted to bring up on this page specifically since, you know, the two of you do such a beautiful job at really dispelling the myths and the taboos around mental illness. And I think that, you know, people often think that infertility or grief post any kind of loss, but obviously specifically my wheelhouse is, you know, pregnancy loss or infant loss. Um, they, they believe, a lot of people believe that the kinds of things that one can go through can cause certain actions or symptoms that often look like mental illness. And therefore, it must be that if you're infertile or if you're grieving, that there's something wrong with you. So I'm going to sort of separate those out for a second because I infertility and loss are very different ideas and both very, very different experiences, although obviously they overlap. But just to take infertility for one, for, for, at, at, in the beginning. Um, so infertility. Infertility is a medical condition. It's a medical condition where one, you know, when two partners come together, when the egg and the sperm are supposed to come together and create an embryo, for whatever reason, that doesn't happen. Whether it's 
you know, 50% of the time we know that it's coming from the male, 50% of the time it's coming from the female. There's also, you know, this undetermined percentage where it's unexplained. But the reality is, is that that's a medical diagnosis. When, when people introduce themselves and say, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm infertile. I mean, you could also say, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm diabetic or I'm cancer or I'm, uh, you know, thyroid. I, I mean, you could say all of those things, but those are medical conditions. What happens in infertility is that there are these, ex there are these, it's ex exactly what this person is saying here. So, Sarifta, that grief, okay, we're going to do grief in a second, but infertility by definition is a monthly grieving of an unfulfilled dream. It's month after month after month of hoping and praying and wishing that you end up with a healthy baby, that you end up with a healthy embryo where you get those two lines on your pregnancy test or that little pink plus. But when that doesn't happen, it can cause feelings of depression, anxiety, um, make you feel as if you're all alone, the feelings of isolation, cause if, if anyone does have any mental health issues, these constant disappointments can trigger some of the mental health issues to come to the fore either again or in the beginning or just trigger them initially. And so what can look like something actually where people are exhibiting, you know, they're not getting out of bed in the morning, they're having trouble eating or they're eating too much or people who are having trouble sleeping or they're anxious about crossing the street or leaving their home. So those actual symptoms are mental health issues that are a sub, that they're, they're the consequence of being infertile or having another cycle that did not end up in a positive pregnancy test. Infertility by itself is not a mental health problem. So that I think, you know, talks about infertility. Grief, on the other hand, and also quite similar. So again, as Sarah Rifka says from Lynx, grief, as she says quite rightly, grief is not a pathological problem. And in fact, the absence of it sometimes is more dangerous. So what I would say to that is this, the, these couples, whether you've gone through a period of infertility before getting pregnant, and then unfortunately losing the baby, or it's just, this was the hoped pregnancy that you wanted. You planned your pregnancy out. You got pregnant. You knew you wanted to have a baby in the summer. You, you got your positive pregnancy test. And then all of a sudden December came and unfortunately you miscarried. Regardless of what the origin is, those, those hopes, those dreams, those thoughts, oh, on Pesach, I'm going to be this month, this many months pregnant. And so I'm not allowed, I'm not going to be allowed to be doing this. I should be doing that. I, I'm going to tell this person. I'm not going to tell that person. I, I, is it a boy or is it a girl? What are the names that we still have left in the family? Who should we name for? How should we name for? Is it going to be you know, curly hair, or is it going to have straight hair? You know, we start doing these, the, the minute that someone gets a positive pregnancy test, we all start naturally in these beautiful hopes and dreams for this child. We think about what the possibilities are and there are endless possibilities of who this child is going to be. And then the moment that that pregnancy is a pregnancy that is not a good one anymore, or when you find out that the baby has died, it's an immediate dashing of all of those hopes and dreams. Often, quite suddenly, where you're not expecting it, where you, you walked into the doctor's office, you're still in your first trimester, you feel nauseous, you're eating carbs all the time, everything seems to be normal, you're not bleeding, and you walk in and they can't find the heartbeat. Or you're in your last trimester and the baby has been kicking up the storm, up a storm, up a storm. And all of a sudden you wake up one morning and you realize you don't feel it exactly. And you take some orange juice and you go lay down and you don't, you still don't feel it. So you go to the doctor, but you're thinking, ah, it's probably nothing. And then shock of all shocks, God forbid, the baby is not alive anymore. These 
circumstances are often sudden and traumatic and horrific for so many people. And that, that immediate trauma and the, in addition to all of the hopes and dreams that one, you know, compiles and one puts together and puts on this pregnancy makes for just an absolute perfect and perfect is really the wrong word, but this perfect um, compilation of grief. We grieve for the things that we loved. We grieve for the things that we wanted. We grieve for the things that we hoped that we would have, and now we don't. And that grief process, while you know, for every person that grief process looks very different. And for some people, it does mean staying in bed for weeks or months. For other people, it means you know, picking themselves up and going right back to work. For some people, it's you know, going to therapists and, and really like doing everything that they can to try to get themselves, quote unquote, back to normal, which we know is never really possible. But the reality of the situation is that grief is not a pathological problem. Grief is not a mental illness. Grief is a natural consequence. And it's not even a consequence. Grief is a natural outcome of what happens when you lose, lose something that you love. And those symptoms, those, those one can, again, as we were talking about with infertility, it can trigger a mental health um, problem or an illness that one either had before or for some reason that grief is triggering it in an individual. So it can trigger a mental illness, but grief in and of itself is not a mental illness. I think that that's like a really important thing to clarify. Um, I know I mentioned to you, uh, we were texting before, that I saw a post on uh, like I was scrolling through posts to prepare and I saw, it was very sad. There was a, um, there, a woman posted a picture of her ultrasound and that there's nothing more pa painful in the world than losing this, this baby that she had never met. And when I clicked on it and I read the comments, there were, at least a dozen people telling her what loss was more painful than her pregnancy loss. Like my son died when he was whatever years old. That is way more like, um, I, I way more painful, like started comparing. So can you, um, kind of address, I, like my, I felt so so heartbroken for this woman because she was trying to express her her own pain, right. not to the exclusion of any other people's of pain, right. but it was it was a really sad thing for me to read all these people's like trying to convince her that their pain was worse. So. It's, it's, it's horrific. It's horrific. It's, I mean, we have a couple people commenting here as well. I, I, look, let's, 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 let's just talk about facts, right? The facts are that a, a, an eight week pregnancy looks very different and feels very different in one's body than a 36 week pregnancy. That is a fact. And Another fact is that a 36 week pregnancy is also very different than a three month old baby that dies, God forbid, of SIDS. And a three month old baby, another fact, a three month old baby is very different than a 10 year old or a 20 year old or an 80 year old. So we're talking about different facts and the facts are that those different light lives, those lives are different. However, the other fact is that pain is pain is pain is pain, period, 
end of story. For the couple who has longed for a pregnancy and finally got pregnant, and unfortunately, as I mentioned before, they got to that eight week ultrasound as this woman that you were speaking about, and there was no heartbeat. For that woman, for that couple, that is intense pain, mm -hmm. intense pain. And it's going to take her a very long time to be able to deal with her pain and put that pain in a place where she can carry it and she can move through it and move on with her life. For the family that had an almost full-term baby at 36 weeks who was already feeling kicking, that baby, if that baby was born at that point, would have been viable and would have been healthy, supposedly, and could have gone on to a very normal, typical life. For those parents, that is a horrific trauma as well. That baby who they thought, who they hoped, who they dreamed, who they imagined, who they could put their arms around their belly, her belly, and she could imagine that baby in her arms, that is a trauma, that is a pain, and pain is pain is pain. But then you have the other family who already knew their baby, who already knew if he was cranky, if she was cranky, if she wasn't cranky, knew, knew how she smiled. They had a name for her, for him. She was named after someone, one of their relatives or a good friend or just a name that was meaningful to them. They, the brothers and the sisters and the family members all got to know this baby and took turns holding the baby and taking care of that baby. The community made meals for this family, brought gifts for this family. That is also a pain, a very different kind of pain, but a significant pain, and so on, and so on, and so on. I, I make it my business to not compare pain. We don't know what kinds of pain people are in. We don't know what, what they're going through in their own lives before they've experienced this pain. We, we don't know all of the surrounding factors about what their support system looks like. We don't know how, how their community has supported them or not supported them. We don't know about the other family members. We don't know whether, um, whether they're, they're in a stable learning, living environment, whether they have enough food and money to put, you know, to put meals on the table. We, we, we don't know anything about these families. The only thing we know is that they're in pain and everyone deserves to be comforted for their pain and does not deserve to be belittled for their pain. That was very well said. <sighs> Look, I, I think that um, one of the things that I've seen through my work is that, I, and this is exactly, so there's someone who just commented, it's exactly what I was just gonna say. So she just wrote that when someone experiences very similar pain, it's still different because of the person as a whole. Mm -hmm. So that literally exactly took the words out of my mouth. I've, I've dealt with couples and I've been with couples and supported them. So that same couple I'll go back to with the eight week loss. I, I've sat with couples who have both, the two of them together, are professionals, they have their own caseload, they're actually in the mental health space, they have their own caseloads, one was in school, one was not in school, and they, everyone in their family was pregnant, they had chosen to wait a little bit longer because they, one of them was still in school, and they finally got pregnant and were excited to share it with the family, and then got to that eight week appointment, and there was no heartbeat. And the two of them, for over a month afterwards, couldn't go to work. Couldn't go to work. They, they couldn't take care of other people in the way that they felt that their patients and their clients deserved because they were so steeped and so deep in their own grief process, traumatized, over the possibility that they were going to have this baby and bring this baby into the world and that baby was no more. 
I was hearing about sleep problems, how they, they couldn't find anything enjoyable, how they were having trouble getting meals on the table. And this was for an eight week loss. And then you have the couple and the family who has an eight week loss and says, eh, it's eight weeks. It's okay. It was just, you know, a few cells. It's fine. Yes. Okay. You know, maybe a little bit more or a heartbeat. Fine. You know, goes back to work the next day, doesn't tell anyone about it, and life goes on. And both of those are normal because we don't get to decide for anyone else, nor do we really decide ourselves in advance what our grief process or what someone else else's grief process is going to look like. We need to do what we need to do to feed ourselves, to feed our souls, to feed our neshama, to do the self-care, to do what we need to do to work ourselves through, through this grief and through the pain. And just because someone else is doing it very differently doesn't mean that that's going to work for you and doesn't mean that you should look to them as your guide. You need to do grief. You need to do pain the way you need to do it. Um, what would you say to, to, to us as a community, like for people who, who haven't experienced this themselves, um, to kind of enable, to, to give people a little bit of a insight and advice on how, I, I mean, I guess when people see other people, they're, they're not really going to know if, correct if who's suffering in this way right we don't we wear wear signs on our chest saying hi you know treat me differently correct right but but somehow i hear lots of horror stories of people in communities making comments that are super hurtful so how can we as a community kind of work to avoid saying hurtful things being hurtful is that it, it, am I asking the question? Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. look, I, I think at the end of the day, the, the, the question is how, how do we, what, what can we do as a community to help support anyone who's suffering mm -hmm. and, and make sure that we're, we, to try our best not to trigger people or not to make them upset. I think that that's where you're going with it. Did yeah. I get that right? Yeah. Um, I think this this really is, is, is a much bigger topic that encompasses much more than pregnancy loss, pregnancy, infertility, um, you know, any of these fertility issues in general. This is about being a sensitive person. This is about being a caring person and knowing that everyone doesn't have a perfect life and people are always suffering behind closed doors that we you know there's that saying that you know, never know what's going on in someone else's bedroom and, and that's that's really the truth that we you know none of us walk around with signs you don't walk around with a sign that says i have cancer you don't walk around with a sign that says i don't have money for shabbos this week you don't mm -hmm. walk around with a sign that says you know i i, I can't afford afford to send my kids to school, whatever, we, we don't walk around with these signs. So I think, you know, specifically in the fertility realm, there, there are a few, um, a few big things that I always tell people. One, first of all, you know, my, my hands all this, I was supposed to have a baby. I, I, my audience for that for that handle really is the people who are suffering and for the rest of the community. It's, it's specifically designed to give chizok and support to everyone who's, who's dealing with something, but then also for everyone else to know that everyone is going through something and therefore to be more sensitive. So what I would say, you know, the, the, the big three are, number one, Never ask anyone if she is pregnant or when she's getting pregnant or anything, Or when are you due? Or, correct. Or <laughs> anything to do with pregnancy at all. When are you due? Or a, literally anything, even if 
she the last time you saw her she looked very different than she does now and her stomach is much larger never ask anyone about a pregnancy ever 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 why or touch their stomach or correct correct touch so touch i i I have, I have a very big thing about touch and I feel that correct or how many children that we have, but we're getting there in a second, one second. Um, the, the, I, I, I feel that it's always inappropriate, whether it's your friend or not your friend to ever touch anyone else's stomach. If it's your friend and you know that she would enjoy hugs, then hug her, but don't, don't touch her stomach, even if she's your friend <laughs> and especially if she's a stranger. Um, <laughs> so, um, why? why? Why can't we ask? Even if she looks like she's about to go to the hospital and deliver tomorrow, why can't you even ask then? Why? Because there are medical conditions and there are medicines that people take that can make you gain weight rapidly, specifically in that area, and make you look as if you're pregnant. And, or, or, uh, so, so, and, and that can be extremely painful and hurtful because Maybe that person is embarrassed about the fact that they lost weight and then you're speaking to them and thinking that they're pregnant. Maybe that person is in the middle of an IVF cycle or some sort of, sort of other cycle and trying to get pregnant, but they're not pregnant yet and they're very bloated and they're embarrassed about that situation and don't want people to comment on it. Three, what if, God forbid, that person, someone you haven't seen in a long time, what if they actually just lost a baby? And they're still carrying around the pregnancy weight because for whatever reason, it's, it's been difficult for them to lose it because they don't lose it. Whatever the reason is, the reality is, is that asking that person could be even more damaging for them and it triggers them and brings up the painful experience of them losing this baby. And then they have to talk about it with you who hasn't seen them in a while or potentially is a stranger and it's just not appropriate to be prying into people's intimate lives in that way. So always, 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 or I should say never, 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 never ask anyone if they're pregnant, how they're pregnant, when they're pregnant, if they're getting pregnant, when they're due, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a big number one. Oh, I've, I've another one. Um, Tell me. The, the, um, do you want more children? Oh, oh yeah, that's another one. Okay, like, so are you finished yet? To, right. Yes. So before we, before I get to that one, I'm gonna do the how many children you have one because that also is the other thing. So um, let me just read. Which yes. Okay, so I'm gonna get to that in a second, Reva. Um, so I think that the this is exactly what Reva's saying. So when I was working at Nahama Comfort. Um, we heard over and over again, and I heard this over and over again when I was going through my own personal stories and my journey. People would, you know, when I was randomly, I was at a work event or I was in another person's um, synagogue or I was away on vacation. You know, the natural course of conversation, people start chatting with each other, someone who you don't know or at a bar mitzvah or something like that is, hi, how are you? What's your name? Where do you live? Um, What's, tell me about your job. And then it's, oh, so how many children do you have? It immediately launches, you immediately launch into how many children do you have? And for someone who's struggling with infertility or with loss, that question is so painful, so painful, because it reminds you of the children that you don't have, reminds you of the children that maybe you did have and unfortunately are not here anymore. It, it reminds you of so many things that are so painful and immediately really can shut the person down. And that nice conversation that you thought that you were having and building rapport with someone can immediately, the walls go up and, and you could see people struggle and stumble and, and you could tell that there's something there and they don't want to talk about it. And, and you've already sort of stepped there and, and it's hard to backtrack. So what I learned at Nahama Comfort and what I continue to teach people is that 
a better way to ask about when you're, it's, it's a natural thing for people to ask in general, just about your personal life. People want to know, they want to know who you are, where you're from, you know, about your job. And the next question is always, you know, about the family, about whether you're married, about your kids, etc. So the best way to really neutrally ask that question without triggering anyone is to say, so tell me about your family. Because when you say, tell me about your family, it doesn't assume that you have any specific status, nor does it assume that you have any specific number of children. So if you're single and someone says to you, tell me about your family, you tell them about your parents and your siblings. If you're divorced, you also could tell them potentially about your ex-husband or your parents or your siblings, et cetera. If you're widowed, it also, widowed or widower, it also works. If you're, if you have, if you're suffering with infertility or you've just had a loss, the tell me about your family, yes, it will cause you to pause and reflect, but it won't trigger you. It'll make you think, oh yes, I wish I could tell you that my family was more robust, but I can tell you about my husband who's really great, who does this job and he's blah, blah, blah. And I can tell you about my four-year-old who's blah, blah, blah. So you can talk about what exists as opposed mm -hmm. to thinking about what doesn't exist. So that, that question immediately neutralizes that awkwardness and it really works for any situation. I'll, I'll just say that I was at a wedding a few months ago and I was seated next to a woman in her middle age and she was seated next to her husband. And I knew that she was very good friends with one of my relatives, but I really didn't know very much about her. And so we started chatting and she told me that she was from California and we blah, blah, blah. And she asked me immediately, she said, so how many kids do you have? And so, you know, I, I don't get, get triggered by that question myself anymore because I'm in a different place. But I, she was asking me a lot of questions about my family, which led me to assume that there was something more that she didn't really want to say about her family, just because I'm in this line of business and I do this a lot. Um, and so when there was a pause in the conversation, I said to her, you know, knowing her husband was sitting right next to her, I said to her, so tell me about your family. And she paused and then she said, you know, we used to live near my parents, but my parents have since passed. My mother, you know, five years ago and my father 15 years ago. And, you know, I live around a lot of friends and really consider our cats to be part of our family. You know, it was, it, in that moment, I didn't make her upset. And I was grateful for the training that I had received and knowing how to use this line. And, and it really works in almost any situation. I really like that. Like really, really. Yeah, it's it's great. And I, I try to bring it up every few months um, in on my handle to remind people that this is this is really something that can be used. It's easy, it's it's not awkward, and, and it really puts the onus back on the person. Um it's it's it gives them the allowance to answer in the way that they want without feeling uncomfortable. Um, so I am grateful to Riva for coming up with this, you know, this statement. And, and it really, I think, I, I, I hope just one person at a time at, you know, all the different points that I mentioned it, that if one person takes this away and doesn't ask people anymore, how many children do you have, then we've already changed the world. So that's, that those are, I, I'm incredibly grateful for that for that and, um, and if people stop touching people's stomachs i actually saw that last week like you saw someone do it in real yeah life. and the person wasn't pregnant and she didn't even look pregnant so i'm not even sure why like Oof. yeah i guess that she's just been pregnant like a few times but she, i mean she had infertility issues right at some point too but it was so like it was, i was just standing next to her and i was i felt awkward just like yeah very Why is the touching your stomach? Like, I don't Very get it. <laughs> um, so so the, the third, um, third piece that I would give over to people, to this audience, is to not give advice. That, that when people are coming to you, if you're in 
this beautiful relationship where people are sharing with you their struggles about their hopes and dreams that have yet to be realized that, or, or they're talking to you about their loss and they're telling you, I, I just had an eight week loss. I just had a 16 week loss. When they're coming to you, they're coming to you in pain. They're coming to you because they're suffering. They're coming to you because they've chosen you as that person who they think can support them and really be there for them when they're struggling. And what they need more than anything else at that point is they need your love, your support. I've said that word four times in the last sentence. <laughs> um, and they need your love and your comfort. They don't need advice. They're not interested in hearing about, you know, that thing you read on Facebook about if you on every fourth Sunday jump four times and take these herbs, then that means you'll definitely get pregnant. So they're not interested in that. They're also not interested in hearing about that really great doctor that your daughter went to that you really should go to because your daughter now is pregnant. They're also not interested in hearing that maybe the doctors did something wrong and really what you should have done or what could have been done is this and you should really see somebody else next time. I mean, and, and the list goes on. What they're interested in is they're interested in help. They're interested in support. They're interested in hugs. They're interested in a safe space to cry and to grieve and to know that you love them. That's what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. If they pointedly ask you to help them to find another doctor or help with something else, then of course you can do that for them at that point. But really, they're just interested in, they, they, all they want is for you to sit with them, to hold them, to cry with them, to, eat pickles with them or chocolate babka, my personal favorite. So that, that's really all they want. They, they don't need anything else. They don't need the suggestions of, well, just try that or try adopt, adoption or try IVF or try that doctor. Those suggestions, not helpful. Just be a friend. Did you see that video with the husband and wife and the wife keeps saying like, my head is killing. And, and she's like talking about how, how badly her head, her head hurts. And he's like trying to give her all, tell her to, you know, oh, but if you just, and she's like, no, no, I don't want to hear your advice. Did, did you see that video? I didn't, but I'm, I'm just, I, but, I, I think I've seen it play out so many different times that so, I'm just imagining and, how it is. <laughs> and he just keeps like interrupting her and, she, and she's like, I, I don't want your advice. I just want the validation. And it just, and, and it turns out she has like this nail stuck in her forehead and he's oh like, God. tell her, just take oh. the nail up. Oh my God. <laughs> oh I'll send it to you. I'll send you that Please. video. It, it's really Please. funny. But um, it's like, but it's true. It's true. We, we usually when we're, we want advice, we don't want advice. We just want to be heard and loved and sat with and and um um please tell people I'm to stop offering kvater to couples yes. going through fertility that's yes. a really yes i my my suggestion specifically about kvater is to not if if it's something that look people out of the goodness of their heart, like let's be clear, like when people are offering it, it's out of the goodness of their heart because they think that this is something that can be done that will be helpful. And, and whether it is helpful or was it, whether it isn't helpful, whether you believe in it, whether you don't believe in it is not really the point. It's coming from a place of goodness. However, however, it's often not very well received by the people who are suffering. And my suggestion to those individuals who have, who, who are, you know, blessed with having a baby boy and having that, that, that option open for people is to maybe speak to the Rav in their community and find out if there's someone that they know that it might be helpful for, 
or speaking to another third party for that couple and not asking the couple themselves because it's very awkward for the couple themselves to turn that down because then they're seen as ungrateful or unsupportive or a, a thousand other things. And, and sometimes they accept because they don't want to be rude. I, there are so many different layers of emotions that go into the, the asking of the kvater, the accepting or not ex accepting of the kvater. I, I always suggest to people to have it done through a third party because then all of the feelings are spared and then it can go to a couple that actually really would want it and would appreciate it as opposed to triggering or making someone upset needlessly. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, listen, I, I really just want to thank you. I, we're, we're getting around that hour mark and being that it's now my live and not your live. So <laughs> I, as I'm obviously joking, tongue in cheek, um, I, I, what I want to say to everyone is that I, this is hard going through infertility and going through grief and, and, and all of the emotions after any kind of loss, post miscarriage, pregnancy loss, infant loss, stillbirth, the, these, these emotions, this journey is really hard. And the best that we can do as a community is try to learn these techniques and, and these different tips to try to support you. But what I would say to all of you who are suffering is that please know that, that, that people are trying. And I'm hopeful that with these kinds of messages and these lives that, that you're doing and that so many of us are doing to try to spread awareness that people will try to regulate themselves in terms of the messages and the kinds of conversations that they're having. Um, knowing that it's not coming from a bad place doesn't help, but it can, I think, I think it just can give the level of empathy also coming, the, the sympathy and the empathy coming from the other side. That even though it's not, it, it's not coming from a bad place and you can, you still can be triggered and of course you can be upset, but use that maybe if, if you have it in, in your reserves at that moment, maybe try to use that moment as a teaching moment for that person and say, you know, if someone says to you, you're, you know, are you pregnant or when do you do say, you know what, actually, um, I, I, I'm actually, I'm really going through something right now and I'm not comfortable talking about this with people who are not within my inner circle. Um, thank you for asking, but that's really private. Um, so you can say something like that, or another thing you can say, depending if, you know, you want to be private or not is say, actually, I, I just had a miscarriage and that question is really painful and hurtful to people like me. Cause it reminds me of the pregnancy that I don't have anymore. And so please think carefully about the kinds of things that you say. Um, look, all of these are about relationships. It's about communication. It's about whether you feel open and whether you feel that you can have these conversations with the person who's on the other end or not, whether they'll be receptive or whether even it's the right place or, or you have enough emotional reserves that day to have the conversation. But I always think that if you can do it, you are also on the ground educating the next person. Mm -hmm. So that that person doesn't go and potentially inadvertently hurt someone else. So we're trying to do it from on high, but if you can, you also can do it from on low. And that's, that's kind of the message I'll leave you all with. Thank you so much. I really learned a lot. I, I, I'm, look, I, I try my best to try to help as many people as possible. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I, to reach more people, it's, it's that, that is my only goal, just to reach more people. Thank you. And I, I love your account and, um, and there's a lot of, I was scrolling through and I was like, oh, what can I share? And I was like, oh shoot, I want to share everything. I can't really rip off everything that you, that you did, but 
Um, you, you can share anything that you want. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just going to say, everybody should check out I Was Supposed to Have a Baby, but everyone's on I Was Supposed to Have a Baby. <laughs> it's on your live. <laughs> So now everyone should check out Project Proactive. So that's what we should do. Um, um, and I will, as I always save my lives. <laughs> um, so they'll be here for 24 hours. And then I'll have the link on YouTube. And then I'll share the link with you as well. And you'll have it up on your space as perfect. well. Perfect. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank have you. Have a good night. Good night, everybody.